Alright, Forgotten Soldier, Chapter 6. A lot of excitement coming up. Battle of Belgrade. This whole book's exciting, but Belgrade's a big battle. Chapter 6. On a hot evening in the summer of 1943, we found ourselves once again in the immediate vicinity of the front. Belgorod had recently been retaken by the Russians, who had set up their advanced positions just beyond the town inside our own lines. The front, which ran through Belgorod from Kharkov to Kurs, was more or less quiet. The campaign, which had continued almost without a break since our withdrawal from the belgorod bernish kursk triangle, had been exhausting. The Russians were now catching their breath and collecting their innumerable dead before launching an even stronger attack against our positions in September. Kharkov had remained in our hands after the slaughter at Slavyansk, and the Russian breakthrough on our southern front had finally been stopped somewhere near Tremenchuk. The Soviets had regain, regained some of their strength and had forced the German and Romanian troops to withdraw from the Caucasus and the Kalmuk Plain. They would also pushed us back from the Donets. However, the situation was not yet entirely in their hands, and strong counterattacks from our side often broke their frantic thrust. Belgorod, Kharkov, and Stalino all figure prominently in any account of German counterattacks. 60,000 troops took part in the Battle of Belgorod. I was one of them. 18,000 Hitlerhugen had also arrived from Silesian camps to receive their baptism of fire in this unequal combat in which a third of them lost their lives. I can remember their arrival very well, in brisk columns, ready for anything. Some units carried flags with inscriptions embroidered in gold letters, Schunkerloen, or the world belongs to us. Platoons of machine gunners arrived, and infantry regiments loaded with bandoliers, stuffed with grenades, motorized regiments with all their heavy equipment. The plane was covered with soldiers and for the next three or four days more and more and more came. Then everything quieted down. By regiment, section, and group we were all directed to precise locations. We were settled down to an armed watch. Once again, I speak as though we knew of the impending attack. In fact, we engaged in these preparations as part of the normal routine. As in the past, I and my comrades were used for a thousand and one chores, which reminds, uh, reminded us of the old days of the Rollbahn. It was suffocatingly hot and dried yellow grasses of the steppe did not hold down the dust, which was stirred up in clouds by the slightest movement. In the evening we sat beside enormous campfires and talked or sang. The front was some 15 miles away, so fires were permitted. There was plenty of time for an abundant correspondence with Paola, and I thought about her constantly. Then one afternoon, we were assembled for distribution of ammunition. Each man was given 120 cartridges and four grenades. Ten of us, nine men in a non-com, were organized as an assault group. Hals was a machine gunner, one of two men with FM Spantaus, each with a number two man. There were three men with rifles, one of them me, two grenadiers armed with automatics and heavy bags of grenades, and a non-com. In total silence and with every possible precaution, we were led to a shelter near a large farm, right behind the front line. An armed section of the Gross Deutschland was next to us, with tiger tanks and heavy howitzers pulled by tractors and camouflaged by real and artificial leaves. 
We walked past a table set up near one of the buildings and a fat clerk took down our identification numbers. At another table, a lieutenant in the cavalry was studying a map, surrounded by other Panzer officers and a couple of non-coms. With painstaking precision, we were taken from the farm to the place marked for us on the map, suddenly at the edge of some woods. I recognized the wide communication trenches which led to the front line, and I think we all had the same thought. Now we're in for it. All around us, other groups were taking up their positions. We formed part of Company 5, which was sent down a communication trench, cutting in at right angles and leading to the bush where the trees stopped. The engineers must have really sweated cutting through all those ropes, roots. Everywhere sections were settling in, improving and deepening their shelters. It was about six o'clock in the evening and the heat of the day was beginning to slacken off. We followed the trench out of the woods and across a range of low hills with wooded crests. An officer with his eyes glued to a map showed us the ways. We turned off to the right, which brought us back under the trees, to where the heat was trapped and much more oppressive than out in the open. Everywhere, men pouring with sweat were jostling each other, looking for their positions. Finally, we came to a large half-covered shelter, packed with young soldiers from Hitlerhugen. Halt! shouted the non-com who'd been leading us. You'll split up here and take positions when the order's given. Your felt fable will explain what's expected of you. He saluted and left us with the Hitler Hugen, who were sitting on the ground or squatting on their haunches, talking gaily. I went over to Halls, who had just put down his MG-42 and w wiping the sweat from his face. Hell, he said. I was better off with my Mauser. This damn thing weighs a ton. I'll be, I'll be with you, Halls. It seems we're part of the same group. We compared left hands, which had both been stamped 5K8. What does that mean? As Olenschein, who had just come up. Our group number, Gefreiter said Halls. If you're not in the 8th, we don't know you. Olenschein looked anxiously at his hand. Damn, I'm 11. Do you know what that means? Not I, but that's Corporal Lenson. He, he must have an inside tip. We're going on a picnic, Lenson said, laughing, secretly displeased that his rank did not let him in on the secrets of the gods. One of the Hitler Hugen came up to us, as pretty as a ripe young girl. Do, do the Soviets hang together in combat? He asked as though we're inquiring about an opposing football team. Extremely well, said Hal, sounding like an old lady in a tea room. I was, I was only asking because I thought you looked experienced, he said. We, we, were all about, we were all about the same age. Let me give you some advice, young man, said Lenson, whose tiny promotion was, after all, worth a little something. Fire on anything Russian without the least hesitation. The Russians are the worst sons of bitches the world has ever seen. Are the Russians going to attack? Well, the child looked very white. We'll surely attack first, said the beautiful young man, whose Madonna face was incapable of a ferocious expression. He walked back to his gang of boy companions. Do you think someone will tell us what all this is about? Lenson said in a voice loud enough to be overheard by the felt fable. Shut up, said a real veteran, sprawled full length on the ground. You'll know soon enough whether you, what you're going to do. Hey, said one of Hitler who took him up. Who's the shit talking like that? You shut up too, you crapheads, said the veteran, an old man in his 30s who must have been taking it for several years now. We'll have enough of listening to you when you get your, your first scratch. One of the Hugen Lohen got up and walked over to the veteran. Sir, 
he said in a assured voice of a law or medical student. Will you please explain your defeatist attitude, which is sapping the morale of everyone here? You just let me whistle my own tune, said the other, who appeared unimpressed by a flowery turn of speech. But I am afraid I must insist on a reply, said the young man. And I say you're a bunch of fat heads who won't begin to think until you've been cracked on your nice little skulls. Another one of the young Hitler boys jumped up as if he'd been shot. His features were regular and firm, and his steel gray eyes reflected an unshakable determination. I thought he was going to rush the older fellow who wasn't looking at anyone. Do you think we're still tied to our mother's apron strings? He asked in a voice as steady as his look. We've been through months of training too, and we're just as tough as you. We've all been in endurance squads, rumor, he said, turning to a friend. Hit me in the face. Rumor jumped to his face and his strong, nervous fist struck his friend in the mouth. The latter staggered for a moment under the impact of the blow and then walked over to the veteran, who decided to look up. Two streams of bright red blood were pouring from the mouth of the Chungalo and running down his chin. Fatheads like me can take it just as well as bourgeois shits like you. All right, said the veteran who decided against coming to blows ahead of H hour. You're all heroes. He turned away and tried to whistle. How about, how about writing your families instead of squabbling like this, said our fellow. Mail will be collected in a little while. That's a good idea, Hall said. I'm going to write my parents. I had a letter to Paul in my pocket, which I'd been carrying around for a couple days, waiting for a chance to finish it. I added a few tender sentiments and sealed it. Then I wrote to my family, when anyone is afraid, he thinks of his family, especially of his mother. And as the moment of attack drew close, my terror was rising. I wanted to confide something in my anguish to my mother, and felt that somehow I could do it in a letter. I had always found it difficult to confide in my parents face to face, even the slightest kinds and had often criticized them for failing to help me. So on that occasion, I was able to express myself. Everything was quiet on that summer evening in 1943. After dark, of course, there will be a 